Welcome to this workshop, Python Programming for Linguists. And I'm happy that you're here, and I'm happy that you want to participate in this workshop. Let me start by saying that this workshop is not going to make you a programmer. It is also not going to make you a linguist, but it hopefully will give you the foundations to start using this tool set, to start using Python, to start using programming in your research and just generally in your life if you want to use it. Programming is a great skill to have, and you don't necessarily need to be a, well, fully rounded developer to utilize programming languages and to just have a little bit of fun doing so. And hopefully these skills will also help you with your research, and they will certainly also help you with understanding the tools that you're using a little bit better. Okay, before we go into the actual content, let's briefly talk about what this is and what this isn't, and I already started doing this. So the idea is that after you complete this workshop, you'll be able to describe what programming is about, to name and describe some basic programming terminology, and this also hopefully helps you to communicate, for example, with developers that you're working with, to model simple problems in terms of data structures and basic algorithms, to write some basic scripts in Python in order to solve specific problems, and we're going to have a look at various corpus linguistic problems to try this out, to utilize some common third-party libraries, such as the Natural Language Toolkit, Spacey, and some others, to construct and apply some basic regular expressions, to utilize Python for text manipulation, to utilize Python to perform concordance and frequency analysis, two types of analysis, common and corpus linguistics, to automatically annotate texts, for example, parts of speech or universal dependencies and named entities, using Spacey, a library that we're going to look at. And we're also going to look at how to scrape web data in order to build corpora using Python. And then we're also going to compute some basic statistics using Python. Hopefully, you'll be able to do all of that once you finish that workshop. How is this structured? So you are right now at the top here. This is the video Python programming for absolute beginners. And this is non-linguistic for the most part. And here I'm going to introduce the language. And we're going to look at a little bit of code and we're just going to find our way into this whole thing that is programming. And at this point, it is important to note that this is targeted towards people who have no prior experience programming whatsoever. So if you are an experienced coder, maybe you want to skip ahead. But the point is, don't be afraid if you have never done this. Now, for each video, there are also some exercises. So for this video, there will be exercises one, two, three, and you can actually do them on your own. You can play with them. They are quite hard. Some of them are quite hard. So don't get disheartened. Don't be afraid. There's also solutions available for you. And these are really there for you to dig deep and to kind of explore all of that. But if you if you don't manage to do them on your first try, don't worry. This is very hard for beginners, but it's also something that's very achievable. And I want you to have the opportunity to really try this out. After that, there's going to be a second video called The Pizza Problem. And this problem video, we are going to solve a very specific, again, non-linguistic problem. And we're going to add the linguistics later on. But for the first one or two videos, I want you to focus on just the language itself and on just how you think in terms of coding, programmatical thinking, um, and thinking in terms of data structures and thinking in terms of algorithms, just to keep things a little bit more um, simple and to th keep things easy. And there's going to be two exercises there, and we're going to solve this problem together. Then there's going to be a video on working with files, text, and regular expressions. There we are moving into the linguistics directions, uh, direction of things. Ex there's two exercises for that, and then there's going to be a live session, which is also going to be recorded. And in that live session, I'm going to solve um, or to, well, I'm going to approach um, a larger number of linguistic exercises or linguistic tasks and then you can also play around with that. And we're going to dig deep there. And then finally, there'll be a video with a little summary and also further resources for you to explore. OK, you are very much invited to code along. And with coding along, I mean, you can access all the materials. This is all freely available for you. I also published all of that under open licenses. So you can also modify the stuff. You can use it, play it, play with it, modify it, do whatever you want with it. And I think that that's important because you'll learn more if you play around with this and if you have a little bit of fun with that. And this is only possible if you can actually do that legally.
And you can find all the materials on GitHub and GitHub is very much used in the developer community. And this is a repository for code, but also other materials. And you can find all of that there. And if you're interested, have a look at GitHub and also have a look at their documentation. There's videos on it. Just read a little bit up on how GitHub works. It's actually fairly, fairly great. And the open source community is on GitHub, so to speak. Because I don't want you to have a lot of technical prerequisites to participate, you can participate in this workshop only using your browser on any device that has a browser. And you can do this using Google Collab. And this is a platform offered by Google on which you can run an experiment with code and where you can program. If you want to do this, and I recommend this, you will, however, need a Google account. And I'm not promoting creating a Google account just for that. But you can do that, and then you can just play along clicking on this button on the GitHub repository. If you don't want to do that, but still want to code along, there's also a video available that details how you can set up your own development environment on your own computer, and then you don't need to use Google at all. But if you want to just participate in the most straightforward way without installing things on your computer, you'll need a Google account, and you can just use um, Google Collab, which is a great tool. And I'm going to show you how this works in a second. OK, so there's one more preliminary before we go into this contents, and this is a disclaimer. And I just want to point out that everything that now follows should be considered, well, a, an oversimplification of, of reality. As I said, this is not a workshop that will make you a professional developer, but this is a starting point. And in order to make this possible, in order to offer you interesting exercises, we are not going to follow best practices at all times. And I'm going to use some shortcuts here and there. I'm going to point these out, but just be aware of the fact that I'm stripping away lots of complexity and that there is often more to this. But still, we're going to lay a foundation that allows you then to dig deeper if that's what you want to do. Also, this workshop is heavily inspired by a number of workshops I held at 35C3 and 36C3. Just as a side note, these are still available. So if you want to go back there, you can Google for these titles. There's also one on natural language processing. And this is kind of where this comes from. OK, let's now start with the first part of content, so to speak, Python programming for absolute beginners. So what is programming? Programming is instructing machines and computers. That's the most straightforward definition. That's the one you've probably heard. Programming, however, is also problem solving. It is also thinking differently. It is thinking computationally. It is thinking like a computer would think, or it is trying to see problems in a way that makes sense to a computer. It is modeling problems and other things. So we are trying to take something in the real world. We're trying to take a problem. We're trying to take a task. And then we're trying to frame this task in a way or model this task in a way that allows us to approach this with a computer. Programming can also be an art. There is beautiful code, and there is less beautiful code. And there's also artists using programming to create beautiful art. Programming is or it can also be a science. And of course, within computer science, programming is not the only thing that's being done, but it's a big part. And also, there's scientific computing. So there's lots, lots there. And programming can also be fun. It's also a fun activity. And I hope that you'll have a little bit of fun here. And I also, again, want to point out that although this is sometimes seen this way, you are not either a programmer or not a programmer. So there is this job title, software engineer. You can be a junior or a senior software engineer. And then programming is your full-time job. But the spectrum is large. So there is also everyday coding. You don't need to do this professionally to just build something that does something for you. And then there's also scientific coding, where you just build a little bit of code or where you just write a little program that does something that helps you with your research. And there's a large spectrum. And sometimes this is seen as binary. Some people believe that they have to be full-on software engineers to even build something very small. I just want to point out, this is not the case. Programming is a tool. Python is a tool that you can use even if you are not an expert. And I, I often make this comparison where I say, well, you don't need to be a published novelist to write an email, right? And you wouldn't say, oh, I'm not a professional writer. I would never write anything. I would never write an email. I would never you know, take notes or something like that. So even if you are not a professional, so to speak, you are still allowed to code. You're still allowed to, to write software. And you're still allowed to solve problems this way. And this is something that's very important to me. And 
you don't need to, you can also just learn a little bit and then do a lot with that. Or you can only learn enough so that you can at least effectively communicate with people who are software engineers. And that also helps a lot to at least have a basic understanding of this. Here's a quote that I like by Rosenberg. It's called, it's difficult not to have a love-hate relationship with computer programming if you have any relationship with it at all. And that is because programming is both fantastic and interesting and fun and also a very creative exercise, but it is also hard, it can be very hard and it can also be very daunting. And so this is, it's a complex relationship, but I think it's a relationship worth having. So what does code look like? Let's start with something that is designed for children or high school students, more or less. And this is called Snap. There are many of these block languages, but these are basically little programming languages that are there for you to teach kids how to code. And this is not what we're doing, but it's still a useful tool to, to show you what happens. So in Snap, to the left here, you can see this is our stage. And on the stage, we have this little arrow thing. And we can now write code to control this little arrow. And this is the code I've written. And so we can see that there are commands. So for example, point towards, and then there are these control structures. We're going to look at that for a second. So let's look at what this does. So the first instruction here is, so when this is clicked and in Snap, there's like this little flag icon. So when this is clicked, then something happens. So point towards the center. And what this does is this means, okay, this arrow points towards the center. Go to X and Y, zero and zero. And if you think about this in a, as a 2D plane, then there's, there's an X value and there's a Y value. And X zero zero is just here in the middle. So this resets this little arrow. Then we clear whatever has been done because this is writing. So this arrow can draw on this little canvas here. Then we're putting the pen down. Then we are saying, let's go. And now something happens. Now we see something that's in programming. It's called a control structure. So here we see this block here that says repeat, repeat for. So repeat something for a time. So whatever is in this block, whatever is in this control structure here is repeated four times. And we are moving 100 steps. Then we are turning 90 degrees. And then we are repeating this. So then we are moving 100 steps. We're turning 90 degrees and so on and so forth. Four times and then pen up. Now think for a second what this looks like. I'm going to count to three and then I'm going to show you. One, two, three. Okay, so what we've done is we've drawn a little square here. So what happened? So we started in the center, point towards the center, go to zero, zero. Then we put the pen down. Then we said, let's go, let's go. And now four times. So we, we move 100 steps, we turn 90 degrees. We move 100 steps, we turn 90 degrees. We move 100 steps, we turn 90 degrees. We move 100 steps, and then we end up here again. And this is a little program that now drew this little square here. So what can we take from this? Well, usually programs can be read just like any other thing. This is, I mean, you mean Snap is designed to be very readable. And basically this program consists of a number of commands that are being executed in order. And then we have these control structures that allow us to do more complicated things. So keep that in mind when we are now proceeding into Python world. So this is Snap. This is designed for kids, more or less. And of course, this is very colorful and it's also fairly, fairly obvious. And if you look at these blocks, you can just draw these, drag these around. You can also have a look at the website for Snap. It's very interesting. This is very easy, but this is not what coding looks like. This can't be programming. This can't be what professionals do all the time. Well, it's not exactly that, but it looks actually pretty close. And we're going to look at that in a second. So in this workshop, we're going to look at Python. And Python is one of hundreds of programming languages. So there are hundreds of programming languages out there. Many of these are built for fairly specific purposes. Python is one that's being widely used and that can be used for almost anything. It's a general purpose programming language. It's free, it's open as an open source, and it's available on almost any platform. That's great. So you can use this on everything, starting on your computer. You can build websites using Python. You can build apps for your mobile phone. It's, it's everywhere. It's modern and it's widely used, and there is a great community. The Python community is very large and it's great and there is lots of stuff and there is lots of tutorials and information available. So it's a great language to get started. It is relatively easy to learn, but very hard to master, which makes it very useful for us. And it is also widely used in the scientific community, both in 
the whole world of computer science, but also in many other disciplines, because it is fairly easy to learn and it offers everything that you need for scientific computing. A side note, there are generally speaking two big versions of Python. There is legacy Python. That's the versions 2, 2x, so most commonly 2.7, and there's modern Python, Python 3.x. Nowadays, we only look at modern Python, and we're not going to consider this older version of Python, but sometimes you'll encounter that, for example, in tutorials. While these two are in some way compatible, there are a couple of differences between these two, which I'm not going to point out, but just be aware of that. But you should always write modern Python, and legacy Python is gone, so to speak but it still exists in some contexts. A note, since this is an introduction for linguists and you've probably heard of R, and now you might wonder, well, why are we learning Python and not R? R is widely used in linguistics and it is even more widely used in Crips linguistics, but I want to point out that R, and this is from their documentation, so R is another programming language, but R is a language and environment for statistical computing and graphics. So R, while it can do other things, you can, build, you can also build websites using R, R at its core is a statistical environment. It's, it's, it's used for statistics. So if you are into statistics, if, you, if your primary purpose is statistics and drawing graphics or graphs, then R is a good choice. Python can also do all of these things. Maybe it's less specialized. Um, maybe some things are a little bit harder when it comes to statistics, but I just wanted to point this out. So we are looking at Python here because Python is an is a language that's designed not for a specific purpose. R is designed for statistics, but Python is a general purpose language. And I think that it's worth to at least learn or have a look at a general purpose language before going into these rather specific things. And also it's personal preference. I just wanted to point this out because you'll see lots of books, lots of materials for, in terms of um, R for linguists, for example, or doing statistics in linguistics with R, things like that. And these are great books. And R is also a very interesting language. It's a great environment and it's worth looking at. But here we're going to look at Python. So you remember looking at that snap code and now we're going to look at Python code. And this is not the same thing. So we're not drawing a little square here, but we're counting up to 10. And the thing is, you don't need to understand exactly what happens here, but I want to point out two things. So here we see a number of lines. We see six lines of Python, and we see print counting up to 10, and then we see something that happens here, and then we see again another print. The point is, comparing this to Snap, we also have lines. And in Snap, we have blocks, here we have lines. So we have single commands, for example, print counting up to 10. That's a command. And what happens here is we are calling a function. That's just what this, what this is named. We are calling a function that's called print with one argument. And that argument is this text counting up to 10. And this is one command on one line. So we have lines and blocks. Here we have a block. And a block you can identify fairly easily because it's indented. So here we have a control structure. So this is multiple commands. And these are units of functionality. And this block here is very similar to that repeat thing that we saw. So here we have a so-called for loop. And we're going to look at that in a second. And this for loop loops or repeats a number of times this command. So we have a command within that loop, within that block. And that command here prints whatever the point in that repeat is out of 10. So it just counts up to 10. And then we again use a command for print finished. And we're going to look at this later um, in this video. Bottom line is, even if we look at Python, now we are in a real programming language, so to speak, used by professionals, we still have commands and we have blocks or control structures. They are executed from top to bottom, line by line. And we can also see that we have individual lines for commands. And we have blocks for units of functionality. And that's all you need to keep in mind for now. There are single lines, single commands, and then there's these units of functionality. And these are executed from top to bottom. I also have to excuse myself. I'm going to front load a lot of stuff on you. So I'm going to now show you a lot of things without actually playing with them. And you might think that, that you are completely overwhelmed, but I just want to give you a little bit of foundation before we then try this out. So bear with me and trust me that this all will make sense. Now that you know what Python code looks like. So this is a Python script. This is a complete little program. This is a complete program that prints numbers, right? That counts. Is it very useful? No. Does it work? Yes. 
but how is it executed? So what do you do with this? You now have this text, but how do you actually run this? So executing code works like this, generally speaking. So you have code and you potentially also have libraries. These are basically external bits of code, new functionalities that you might want to use in your program. And you hand this code to Python and then Python executes it. And then you get results. Now there are various ways of doing that. For example, you could have a script and you can think of a script as a text file that contains this code. We can also do this interactively. I'm going to show you what that looks like in a second. And then there's also notebooks. And in this workshop, we're going to use so-called notebooks. And these allow you to run Python in a browser. It's important to note that notebooks, what we're going to use, these usually run on a server. You can also run them on your own computer, but these usually run on a server. Whereas scripts and interactive um, Python shells, you will need, if you want to do this, you will need to install Python on your system. There are various versions and distributions. You don't have to overthink this now. Um, if you are using Python more seriously, for example, in your own research, you probably want to do this. And here I would strongly recommend Anaconda, which is a commercially available but free solution for that. And there's also a video that exactly details how you install that and how you then run Python on your own machine, if you're interested in that. But you don't need to. For this workshop, the only thing you need to to is accessing notebooks. I'm going to show this to you. Just so you know what this looks like. So this is a script. So here we are running the script, hello world.py. And you can look at that using Python. So this is a command line. And then we type Python, hello world.py. And now this happens. So this is the little program when it runs. If you run in interactive mode, we basically get this little interface where we can find individual lines or also control structures, and then Python keeps track of that. So for example, here I'm writing text equals hello world, and then I'm printing that text again, which is then hello world. And that's so-called interactive mode, which we're not going to use, but it is interesting uh, to do because you can keep track of what you've done. What we're going to do is we're going to use, well, Git and GitHub. I've already briefly talked about that. And then we're going to use notebooks. And we're going to use Google Collab or Jupyter Notebooks and these are heavily used in the scientific world and in data science. And as I said, you will need a Google account if you want to run these in Google Collab, or you can have a look at the video and see how you can install these Jupyter Notebooks. So let me briefly show you how this works. So here you can see the GitHub repository for this workshop. It might look a little bit different for you, but this is generally speaking what it looks like. And then you have this button here, Open and Collab. I'm just going to press that. And this will take me to Google Collab. And I'm logged in. If uh, you are not logged into Google, you'll need to do that. And then you will get a list of available notebooks. And right now, at least for me, there is only one notebook available. You'll see probably more. And then I can click these. And now the notebook opens up. And this is what it looks like. I'm going to zoom in a little. Now, these notebooks are very interesting because these notebooks uh, contain cells. So each of these is a cell. And what you can do here is you can mix text or even graphics and images with code. And so these are these interactive tools in which you can write and also code. And this is used in science for, obviously, for obvious reasons, because here you can, for example, also document what you're doing very neatly. So for example, here, let's start with something simple. So you click. So this is a text cell here. And this is a code cell here. So if I if I select this code cell, I just click it. And then if I press Control and Enter, I will be, so I'm now running this. Now Google warns me that this is not done by Google. Uh, I don't care. I just want to do it. You press Control and Enter, and you can do this um, on your own. And now it's initializing. It takes a second. And now it runs this line. So print, welcome to this workshop. Now it ran this line, and it printed this line. So this is a tiny program, so to speak, and we just ran that. And this is, it's very neat. If you want to add new blocks, for example, you can do that. You can just click in between here and then you can say code. Now you get a new cell. Let's say we want to print something again. So print, this is neat, for example, control and enter. You can also press this button in front here. It runs this code again. So let's say we want to add a couple of exclamation marks here. And then we run this, and then we do this. By the way, 
Python can also do calculations, for example. So you can do something like 2 plus 2, press this button, and then we get the results here. So you can run code here, and then you can also write in here. So let's say you want to document that. You can add a little bit of text here, and you can write in the cell above, I'm adding two numbers, which of course is a little bit pointless here, but you get the point of this. And then these notebooks can be shared. You can use these notebooks together and multiple people can work on them, which makes them fairly neat. But I know that this is probably a little bit confusing right now because there's lots of stuff here. So let's go back to the slides and we'll go through this one by one. And I want to reiterate, we are now laying the foundations for a more hands-on, more, more realistic exercise in video two, and it's going to be this pizza problem. So bear with me. Okay, back to the slides. So as you've seen, we have commands and we have these structures, we have these blocks. And I want to introduce a couple of basic building blocks that we can use to build programs. And these are only six, but most tools, most programs you see actually consist of a combination of those. And the basic building blocks we're going to look are variables. And you can think of variables as containers to put data in. So a variable could look like this, r equals 13. So we have a variable or a container called r, and we put the number 13 in it. So we tell the computer, hey, computer, I want you to create a box. And in that box or in that little thing, in that shelf, please put a number. Let's call this number 13. Let's call this number r, and I want this number to be 13. Maybe I want to change it later. Now you can also have lists, and lists are, well, lists of, let's call them data things. For example, variables. So let's say you want to store more than one number. You want to store a number of numbers. And in Python, this looks like that. So you give them a name, L, for example, equals, and then in brackets, one, two, three. So you tell the computer, hey, please create a list. And that list contain, contains of three numbers. And I want you to now remember this list under the name L. And these names also for variables are more or less arbitrary. So you could have also called this um, list not L, but let's say my numbers or something like that. Then we have loops and we've seen two of them, one in Snap, one in Python. And a loop essentially is a structure that allows you to repeat something until some condition is met. So let's say repeat this as long as a certain number has been reached, for example. Then we have if constructions, do something if some condition is met. And you've encountered these in your own life lots of times. And these are actually very flexible and these can be used for a lot of things. Let's look at a very practical example, the airbag in your car. So the airbag in your car is not just randomly going off, but there is a little computer in there and a couple of sensors that actually check if a couple of conditions are met. So for example, a very simple airbag could be something like if you have a certain speed and then you very suddenly decelerate. So not just braking, but very sudden deceleration. So if there is a very sharp change in speed, then pop the airbag. And that would be an if construction. So let's say we have this variable speed. And if that variable from one moment to the other changes rapidly, then the condition is met and the airbag is popped. And that would be a very practical use of an if construction. Then we have functions. And functions are units of code that complete specific tasks. And we can reuse these. We're going to look at an example in a second. And then lastly, we have dictionaries. And these are, again, let's call them data things that contain so-called key value pairs. So for example, we could have a dictionary called cat. And that could contain, let's say, one value pair, key value pair. And that key is age and the value is two. And so we can store information, named information, about a thing in these dictionaries. So let's look at these one by one. OK, so let's have a closer look at variables. So variables are containers. Here we have three different variables, a, b, and c. And remember, these names are arbitrary. a is 13, b is hello world, and c is 42.42. .42. So it's important to mention that these variables obviously can change. So you have a container named A, and this at this moment contains 13. But of course, you can change this to any other number. 
It's also important to know that variables also have types, and these types describe what type of data is in them. So here we have an integer, a whole number, a string, letters, and a float, a comma-separated value. Python is very good at doing this on its own or of managing this on its own, but it's important that these can't be easily mixed with each other because for the computer, a number is something very different than, let's say, a character, and even an integer is something very different than a comma-separated value. But Python, again, does this internally very well. It's just important to note that these types exist and that there are programming languages, for example, C or C++, in which you have to be extremely precise about these. And whenever you create a variable, you need to point out the type. You can do this in Python as well, but you don't necessarily have to. Although it's, it's starting to become considered good practice. Let's look at this in Google Colab. So here we have these three variables, and I'm just going to run the cell again using Control Enter. So that we have these. And now let me just add a line here. If I just type print A, for example, we now can show these. We now can print this number. It's important to note that in these notebooks, I can also just use the variable name without the print, and it will still print it. But if you were to write a script, you'd need to have the print here. Now let me change A to 15. Now, if I run this again, it's still 13 because I haven't run the cell up here. If I now run this, internally, the number has changed, and now A is 15. Similarly, B is hello world, and so on and so forth. So of course, we can also do a little bit of math. So here we have, again, three variables. Now these are called x, y, and z. So x is 5, y is 10, and z now is x plus y. So z, as we expect, is now 15. And that works very neatly. Now let's look at what happens if I, for example, try to do something like this. So z now is x plus hello. So we are mixing types here. So x is an integer, hello is a string. Let's uh, see what happens. And if I run this, we will get an error. Unsupported operand type for plus int and string. So you can't use this plus operator, this is called an operator, with two types that are incompatible. And strings and ints are incompatible. So this does not work, as expected, uh, to be honest. So z, um, x plus y, and let's do this again. OK, so these are variables. Let's go one step further. So lists, again, are lists or containers that are a little bit larger than a variable. The, these can contain more variables. So this list here, named l, contains four integers, one, two, three, four, and the variable a. And the syntax for these lists is just using these brackets here. And lists are fairly straightforward if you look at them. So this is a list called L, and it contains 1, 2, 3, 4, and A. Now, it gets interesting if we want to print these, or if we want to access individual elements here. It's important to note that, so this is the, the list again, 1, 2, 3, 4, and A. And let's just assume that A is 10. So A is a variable, and somewhere else in our code, we have to find A to be 10. In lists, each of these elements here internally can has an index. It, it can be indexed by a number. And this index starts at 0. So the 0th number in that list is 1. The first number in that list is 2. The second number in this list is 3. The third number in this list is 4. And this variable is indexed uh, by the number 4. In coding, we always start counting at 0. Just get used to it has something to do with how computers internally store numbers and how computers internally work with numbers. So even though we have 1, 2, 3, 4, this could also be A, B, C, D, something like that, right? We can always refer to these by their index number. So if we are now looking at L, 0, so we're going L and then 0, this is the index, and we can indicate the index by these brackets. We are now pointing at the 1. If we do L3 here, we are pointing at the four. Let's look at this in the collab notebook. So here we have a variable called a, that is six. And then here we have a list, one, two, three, four, and then a. And a now is not five, but six, right? Now we can basically look at what is at L index three. Now we can count one, 
This is the one, but this is not the index one, but this is the index zero. So zero, one, two, three. So L3, L index three will return four. If we now use the index four, zero, one, two, three, four, we will get A. And A, of course, is this variable. So we will get six, right? And this is how lists work. And the important concept here is that we can refer to individual parts in the list by their index. So keep in mind, for lists and many other types, there are these hidden or invisible indices starting with zero. OK, so we can add a little bit more complexity to that. And what we're going to do now is we're going to put lists inside of lists. And now these are then called lists of lists. And I've abbreviated this here as lol. So a list of lists is a regular old list, but instead of numbers or variables, we are putting lists inside a list. So here we have a list A, one, two, three, and a second list, list B, four, five, six. Now our list of lists contains the LA and the LB list. Now, if we look at this in more detail, we can see that this is a list, brackets, and then there is the list A, A, one, two, three, and the list B, four, five, six. That's a list of lists. Now, that's all good, but how do we access individual elements in these lists? We already know that if we have a regular old list, we can just use the index. So LA, one, zero, one, is two. Now, for these list of lists, we can do a very similar thing, but we have more indices. So the first index here, zero, refers, just as in the other case, to the zeroth element in the list. So for our list of lists, that then is the list A. So that zero refers to list A. And now that second index, the one, refers to the one-th or the first element in that first list. That is the two. So if we go list of lists, zero, one, we are basically saying, please give me the first or the zeroth, so to speak, list in the list of lists. And within that, I want the element indexed by the index number one, and that is then two. So here we can see that very example, LA, LB, and the list of lists. And now if we want to access the zero and one here, we get the two. Now let's imagine that we want to get to that five here. We have to briefly think about this. So in this list here, the list of lists, we first need to go into this item here. So into the LB element. So that is one, zero, one. And now we want to get to that five here. So zero, one, so one, one. Let's run that and that is the five. And of course, we could now also add a list C if we wanted to. And let's say this is seven, eight, and nine. And we add this here, so LC. And now down here, we can still run, for example, one, one. This gives us still the five, but now we can also do a list of lists two. So zero, one, two, and then let's go to two. So zero, one, two. 0, 1, 2. So this will give us the 9. OK, one thing I want to point out is that we can run functions on lists and also on other things. So for example, here, um, by the way, what I'm doing here is we have a list, and then I'm just directly printing that. So here we have a list, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And now we can use this function append. And with append, we can add numbers to the list or things to the list, not just numbers, but we can add things to the list, to the end of the list. So here we are doing an append zero and an append three. So we are appending two numbers. Let's run this and we get one, two, three, four, five, zero, three. And another function that we have available for lists is sort. So now we run sort and then print again. So now we get zero, one, two, three, three, four, five. So we get that list sorted. As a side note, similar things exist for text. And this has nothing to do with lists. So let's say we create a variable called text. And let's put hello inside to that variable. And let's also print that. Beautiful, prints hello. And now we can use, for example, the function upper. And that will now print this in uppercase.
And that is just something handy to know. And there are lots of these functions. And if I do just a dot here, that's the notation, um, I'll also get a number of options here that I can use. So for example, there's also lower. Um, and there's also things like uh, is digit, for example. I can run is digit. And then this returns false. Now, if text was, let's say, one, two, three, and I run this, we get true. And there are lots of these functions that we can use, but we'll dive into that in a later video. OK, now let's have a look at loops. And loops are interesting, and we've seen those um, twice already. So for this example, let's imagine that lists work like box. Lists are kind of boxes. So imagine a box, and in that box, which is here represented as a list, we have three items, i0, i1, and i2. And now we want the computer to take each of these items from the box and show them to us. So we are going to write a loop here. And that loop looks like this, for item in box, print item. So we are basically telling the computer, hey, computer, please take this box. And then for each item, take that item out, show that item to me, and then put it back. Then take the next item out, and so on and so forth. So for item in box, print item. So what happens here? We are now in the zeroth step. Computer basically takes out that zeroth element from the box, and this is i0, position 0. Now, in the second step, we take the next element in the list. So i1, that's position 1, step 1, item i1. And then lastly, we do the, the same thing for the last item, the box. And so we can loop over, for example, these lists. And we can have a look at that now. So here we have that same box or that same list. And here we have that loop. So let's run this. And so we get 0, 1, and 2. And of course, we can now add. And that's the beauty of this. We can now, for example, add another element here and run this. And it will just work. Of course, since this is a block here, indented, we can also do multiple things here. So we could print everything twice, for example. There's not much point to it, but it could work. But let's now say we have, instead of um, these strings, we have numbers. So let's say we have one, two, and three. And now we could do something like print the number. And then we want to print the number, but times 10, for example. You know, we get 1, 10, 2, 20, 3, 30. And I hope that you see how useful this is and how this can be used for various things. Now, for fourth thing, we're going to look at if constructions. And these are fairly simple, but very powerful. So for if constructions, we think back to that airbag example. And so here we can see one. So we have a variable a is the integer 10. And then this is the if construction. So we have these statements. If a is larger than 15, do that. Print a is greater than 15. Else, print a is not greater than 15. And this is fairly easy. If you are capable of reading English, you will understand what is happening here. And these here use very common comparison operators. So greater than, smaller than, and the double equal sign for equals. Let's have a look at that. Very straightforward, but powerful. So here's the same example. So a is 10. If a is greater than 15, print a is greater than 15, else print a is not greater than 15. So a is 10, so we expect it to print a is not greater than 15. Let's run this. A is not greater than 15. Let's change A to 20. And let's run this again. A is greater than 15. And of course, we could also have multiple ones of these. So let's say if A equals equals 10, print A is 10. And now we have still the 20, so it's still greater than 15. Let's try what happens if we put 10 here and then run it. A is 10. But now what happens if the number is actually smaller than 15? So let's make the number 5. And let's run this again. And we get no output because we have no condition for that. The computer doesn't know what to do now. It just knows, OK, if A is greater than 15, I do that. If A is 10, I do that. And it has no information what to do if the number is smaller than that. So we need to be aware of this. The computer is not doing anything on its own. It's only doing exactly what we told it to do. And if there are cases that we didn't think of, they won't be automatically solved, right? 
So it's important to always keep track. Let's now look at a very interesting concept that is of functions. So functions are a little bit more complicated. With functions, we can now add our own little functionalities. So we've actually had a look at a couple of functions already. So we looked at print. And print is a function that is already built into Python. So the language itself provides us a variety of functions. And a function is a bit of code that does a very specific task for us. But we are not limited to the functions that are already built into Python, but we can also write our own ones. And it's actually very easy. So here we are writing a function that adds two numbers. And of course, this is already in Python. That's just an example. So we are kind of reinventing the wheel here. We can still do it. So we are using this keyword def for define. So we're defining a function. We call that function add, could have any name, brackets. And then we need to have so-called parameters. And these parameters are variables that we can use within our function. So we have two, a and b. Then we have the colon, and now we have a block. And in that block, we do all the things we want to do in that function. So here it's very simple. We create a new variable called result, and result is a plus b, and then we return that result. And in programming speak, this is then what the function returns after we've called it. So we are now calling this function, and we are passing two numbers to it. We're passing two parameters to it, or two variables to it, and then it returns the result. Okay. It's, it can be very complicated, but if you think about it, actually not that hard. So let's look at this in Collab. So here we have, again, let's go down here first. So print is an inbuilt function. Print, hello world. Round is another inbuilt function. So we don't have to do anything. Round is available to us. And round takes two things here, right? Um, so round takes a number. And then round also takes a second number, an integer, that indicates um, to how many positions you want to round it. So for example, here, we round the number 1.234. We want to have zero digits after the comma. Let's say I do one here. And now we have 1.2. Let's say we do two. And now we have 1.23, and so on and so forth. And these are inbuilt functions. Let's build our own. So we are defining a new function. Same thing, called add. And so here we have a and b. Result, let's create that. And now this is available to us. So now we can use add, and we can plug in 5 and 10. And this now just returns 15. And just to show that this is something we've created, we can also name this any way we want. So let's just call it that, just random selection. And now if I have to replace this here, now this function is there for adding. Let's say we want to do um, something else. Let's say we say multiply by 100. And now we only need one here because we only need one parameter. And so, so now, and so now we only need one parameter because of course we already know that we multiply by 100. And so the result would be a times 100. And then we return this. We don't even have to do that. We can just return this directly. So we could do something like this to make it a little bit more uh, streamlined. And now we have this function. Let's run this. So multiply by 100. And uh, Google Collab already knows this, that this function is now available to us. So we can do that. Let's plug in the 10 here and run this. And of course, we then expect a thousand. And we can do this. Now, let's do one more. We can now also use these functions within other functions. Um, and just to freak you out a little bit. So instead of putting in a 10 in here, let's put in the result of the same function. But so let's do 10 in here. Now let's think about what happens. So we're, we're calling this function, multiply by 100, um, and we're putting in 10. So it's going to do 10 times 100, which is 1,000. And then we're putting 1,000 into that same thing times 100. So let's run this. And of course, we get back 100,000. So we can put in the results of functions in other functions. And this is, of course, a very powerful concept. And this is because we're returning here 
the result. We're not just printing it. Okay, let's look at the final piece, and this is dictionaries. So dictionaries, as I said, contain key value pairs. So here we have a dictionary called word one, and that dictionary and dictionaries, contrary to lists, are not indicated by the angular brackets, but by these curly brackets here. We have two key value pairs for this dictionary. One is called lemma, that is the key, and the value is cat. And then we have another key value pair where the key is pos, and the value is noun. And now we can do things like that. So we can now refer to these similarly to how we can refer to indexes of a list, but now we can refer to these by name. So we now can go, OK, I want to have the dictionary word one, and please give me the pos, which then would be the noun. So we can here uh, use names for the things we store in these dictionaries. And internally, Python uses dictionaries very heavily. Um, everything is a dictionary if you think about it in a specific way. But it's important to just know this concept. And I'm not going to dig too deep into how dictionaries work, but it's very interesting. It's just important to know that these exist and how these work. So finally, let's look at that in Google Collab. So here we have this same dictionary. I just called it word here, not word one. Lemma cat, pause noun. If we now just um, look at the dictionary itself, we just get uh, back what it looks like. And now we can, of course, also use the index again. So let's go lemma here. And then we only get back cat. And if we were to type in POS here, we would get back noun. If I type something in here that does not exist, we will get a so-called key error because that key does not exist within the dictionary. And that, of course, is uh, very interesting. What we can now also do is we can add new things to the dictionary. So let's say we don't just want to have lemma and pause, but let's say we also want to have something like plural. We could just do that. Um, we can now assign things to that. So let's say the plural is cats. Let's do that. Nothing happens because we're not printing anything. But now, if we look at this dictionary, we now see that we have added this information to it. And now we can, of course, also again access that using this syntax here. And now we have the plural form in here. And we can store um, arbitrary information within that dictionary. And of course, you can also put lists into a dictionary. You could put dictionaries into dictionaries. And you can go crazy here. Finally, I want to show you this first example. And this is the very first script I've shown you where we looked at what Python code looks like. And now we can figure this out. So we have a command print here. We know what this does. It prints that. And now we have a for loop. And here we have a function that we haven't seen yet. So let's explore this function first. OK, so, so just let's simply call range for 5 independently of the loop. And then we get back this range object here. And now we don't exactly know what this is. And um, I'm just now, you, you now have to take my word for it, that this behaves very similarly to a list, although it is not a list. It's an object, but we're not talking about objects in this uh, video here, because that's a fairly advanced concept. It's not hard, but we're not going to talk about this. But let's assume that this is just a list. So now we can also use indices here. So in range. At indice 0, we have 0. Uh, at, at, let's say, 2, we have 2. At 1, we have 1. So range generates ranges. So if we were to treat this as a box, so let's say for item in range 10, and you've already seen that, print item, we, I forgot the colon we get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So this generates a range of numbers. So here, we do the following. So for i, we don't call it item, but i, for i in range 10, print. And now this is what's called an f string. And you can use f strings to print variables combined with text. If you want to print a variable within text, you can use this called, this called f string. So you put an f before the marks here. You can do that, and then we print finish. So let's look at what this looks like. So here we have counting up to 10, 1 out of 10, 2 out of 10, 3 out of 10, and so on and so forth, finished. Now, as you've noticed, probably, I've put plus 1 in here. And that is due to the fact that computers start counting at 0. So if I didn't do that, 
we would get the following. 0 out of 10, 1 out of 10, 2 out of 10, and so on and so forth. So that's why we just added the 1 here. And these are the little things you need to think of. This was a basic overview over the core building blocks. And I know that this was a lot. Please have a look at the exercises before you move on. Play around with this. You can use the Google Colab notebooks. You can set up your own Python environment. Just play around with this. This will get more natural if you play around with it, and the exercises hopefully help you do that. If you are struggling, just have a look at the solutions. There's also some more text in there. And then in the next video, we are going to take all of these building blocks and we are going to build a solution for a very specific little problem that has to do with ordering pizza. See you then.